and welcome to Eye of the Needle, a podcast from Columbia Threadneedle Investments that aims to demystify the world of investing and shine a light on the people that look after your money. I'm Mark King, Head of Investment Content, Amir, and joining me as co-host is Anna Robinson, UK Wholesale Marketing Manager. Anna, how are you? Hi, Mark. I'm well, thank you. Tell us who we've got on the podcast this episode, Anna. In this episode, we're joined by Simon Bond, a Director of Responsible Investment Portfolio Management. We'll be speaking to Simon about social impact, why people aren't happy, and how we as investors can try to change that, and generally shooting the breeze about investing. Welcome to the podcast, Simon. Thank you. This episode will also feature our ongoing ABC of Investing series, our 60 second challenge, this month in history, and three things to ask your IFA this month. But before that, let's start with a few questions for Simon and find out a little bit more about the face behind the fund. So Simon, let's take a look back to the start of your career. What made you want to become a fund manager? Well, funnily enough, um, I didn't start off, even in the investment industry. I started off as a chartered accountant, a trainee chartered accountant. (laughs) Um, I literally went in and took a spike of of receipts in builders merchants and turned them into profit and loss accounts and balance sheets. Now that was absolutely fantastic training for what I subsequently did as an analyst initially. Uh, And finally, because in those days, an analyst led to becoming a fund manager to what I am at the moment, which is a fund manager, but also responsible for the portfolio construction of our responsible investment strategies. So was there a plan from accountancy to fund management or did you just fall into it? How how did it happen? I fell into it by a series of events that look very nicely planned, um, but effectively (laughs) I moved into investments um, using effectively investment accounting as my conduit, as my Uh, entry. Okay, very good. Never looked back? Never looked back. (laughs) Uh, What does a typical day at work look like for you? Um, It's very, very varied. And in fact, it doesn't necessarily mean being in the office because a great deal of the effort that I put into responsible investment and managing um, involves engagement. Engagement with the sorts of entities that we think are doing good for society and that will provide the financial returns we're looking for. And how often do you think of the end investor when you work? I think of the end investor all the time. And in fact, I think in terms of an end investor because I personally and my family, etc., a lot of the time are actually invested in the funds that I'm running. Now, that gives you quite a lot of focus, but a lot of the funds that I'm running are actually retail investments. And so I think in terms of people that are invested in the funds constantly. There's a lot of responsibility in that, of course, as well. There is. Uh, and it's a question of um, doing the right thing um, and doing the best that you can. Um, but it's also doing the right thing for society and doing the best thing that we can for society at the same time. And that's the real emphasis I want to put on this. Yeah. What do you like to do in your spare time, Simon? What spare time? Yes. <laughs> um, I am particularly keen on um, sport, etc. But I'm a, quite a keen sailor. Mm-hmm. Um, I've taken quite a lot of exams um, in sailing, so I'm much better on the um, on the theory behind it than I am on the practicalities <laughs> of sailing. Um, so a uh, little bit of the Uncle Al book from Only Fools and Horses <laughs> in me, I think. Um, but I also am very keen in um, sport, watching football. Mm-hmm. My daughter plays hockey. Um, those kinds of areas. I pretty much will watch any sport wherever I can find it. Very good. Right then, we'll wrap up with this segment with a few rapid fire questions. What's your favourite book? My favourite book is Cider with Rosie by Laurie Lee. Um, Always has been ever since I studied it for O-level in those days, (laughs) O-level English. It stays with you. You're dating yourself here, Simon. (laughs) I am indeed. Yes, I am indeed. But I also love history books and love history. Uh, and there's a book um, called Dreadnought by um, by Massey, which absolutely explains the origins of the First World War in a way that no other book has done. Wow. Um, what about films and or TV shows? Films. You won't be surprised to hear Master and Commander, given my <laughs> my sailing, um, but also the history, of course. Master and Commander. It's very historically accurate. Is um, it really? Yeah. It's, ah. it's a very good representation, better than a lot of the poor representations that we may have seen from films of the past Mm. Um, so that would be my favorite film tv um i love comedy 
I love Laurel and Hardy. I love David Jason, No New Fools and Horses, hence the Uncle Albert reference. <laughs> Indeed. Uh, and so absolutely that would be uh, where I would point the finger. What's your, the what's your favourite scene? Is it falling through the bar or the chandelier? <laughs> I think one of my favourite scenes, given that I've studied navigation, <laughs> would be where they approach the oil rig and say, which one, which way is Holland? <laughs> And um, he says it's over there, and he turns around and says to Uncle Albert, "See, all you've got to do is ask. It's over there." <laughs> That's very good. How about band songs or albums? Yes, um, I am very much into Northern Soul, and so actually albums become a little bit more difficult because the Northern Soul is based on rare singles. Mm -hmm. um, so. That is my love, dancing, etc. as a Northern Soul. I went to a club in the early 80s that was a Northern Soul club in St. Anne's Road, Tottenham. Uh, and <laughs> not the home of Northern Soul. Not quite, it's North <laughs> London Soul, I suppose. Yes, but yeah. That absolutely um, blew my mind. Mm. The dancing, the atmosphere, the whole thing. Uh, and so I've spent the rest of the time since those days in trying to find those, those songs that they were playing at the mm. time. Um, and so my favourite song is probably The Competition Ain't Nothing by Carl Carlton, which is a classic Northern Soul song. Mm. And um, I often think of that in terms of what we're doing with the strategy, because it is innovative. Um, it is something that nobody else is doing in the way that we're doing it. And I often think about actually, wouldn't competition be quite a good idea, funnily enough, for, for what we're doing? We're going to hear more about that in a second, but um, let's move on to uh, favourite sports or sports teams. Uh, it won't surprise you to know when I reference St Anne's Road, Tottenham, um, is where I came from. Um, I grew up in Himes Park, which mm -hmm. is pretty much between Tottenham Hotspur and Lake Norrie in terms of uh, the, the two local football teams. Uh, I support both. I'm a season <laughs> ticket holder at, uh, at Tottenham Hotspur. Okay. So you, you chose wisely, I would say. It's worked out reasonably well, particularly last year. Yes. Yes. Yeah. yes. Uh, apart from the final, of course. Apart from the final. But I also love cricket. I'm mm -hmm. going to Lords to the third day of the Ashes. Yeah. I'm lucky to get a ticket there. Um, I will watch any sport anywhere. But, um, <laughs> but football's my first love. Okay. Sky Sports is always on in the household then. Sky Sports would be on in the household. Um, however, I prefer to actually physically go and watch it. I'm not one of these armchair fans. Okay. I, I will travel around the country, around the world, or particularly Europe, and watch football. And it doesn't have to be Tottenham. Mm -hmm. uh, when I was last in Munich, I got a ticket and I went to the Allianz Arena and I watched Bayern Munich against Anderlecht. I will watch any any team, <laughs> any live sport. As a Crystal Palace fan, the idea of watching your team in Europe is uh, a pipe dream, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> How about desert island food? That is a really um, simple, my simple tastes come out, but particularly there is a new product from Unilever and it is Marmite peanut butter. Mm. And the reason particularly that I refer to that, which would be of course on toast, um, <laughs> the way to eat that, but particularly because the last time that I was in Sainsbury's, you mentioned not being happy. I'm shopping in Sainsbury's with my daughter, so I'm not happy. I reach up for a, a jar of peanut butter and she physically stops me from buying it. And I think, well, okay, I know about food nutrition. I know about what I should be eating, what I shouldn't be eating, the protein content, etc. And I said, why can I not buy this peanut butter? She said, palm oil. Mm. And I put it back on the shelf. So we then went and Googled what peanut butter doesn't have palm oil. And in March of this year, Unilever launched Marmite peanut butter and it has no palm oil. And so for a Father's Day present, I got two jars of Marmite peanut butter <laughs> and that's what I would take with me onto my desert island to eat. Just got to find a taster. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. exactly. Yeah. Finally in this section, who's your hero? The person I probably reference the most in terms of admiration is a Victorian philanthropist, an American Victorian philanthropist okay. called George Peabody. Mm -hmm. um, he left um, the Peabody Trust. Um, for the benefit of the London poor, so he came to live in London, um, for the benefit of the London poor, that still exists to this day. His statue sits behind the Royal Exchange. I pass his statue every day. And indeed, when I became an analyst in 1991, um, that was the first entity, Peabody Trust Housing Association. The legacy of George Peabody through social housing was the first entity that I analyzed as an analyst. And that reminds me that actually you can do good and get the financial return you should expect for the risk that you're taking. And I'm reminded of that on my way 
from and to the office every morning and every evening. However, my real hero is my dad. Oh. Oh. They're going to say Glenn Hoddle or Ozzy Ardiles <laughs> or something. <laughs> no, genuinely, he, he's the only one I would say is a real hero. Mm. Not with us anymore, but uh, yeah, that, that's Love my it. dad. Love it. Thank you very much, Simon. We'll be coming back to you later for more questions. We will indeed. Now, before we get to you to take our 60 second challenge, we're going to continue our exploration of the ABC of investing. Regular listeners will know that each episode, we take three letters of the alphabet and attempt to demystify the jargon heavy world of investment. Today, we've reached M, N and O. So without further ado, let's launch into this week's letters. M is for market capitalization, a measure of a company's size calculated by multiplying the total number of shares issued by the current share price. Companies are commonly grouped according to size, such as small cap, mid cap or large cap. N is for net asset value or NAV or even NAV for short. This is the value of a company or fund's assets minus its liabilities. Some investors believe that NAV can give them a useful indication as to whether a company is expensive or cheap. O is for open-ended fund. This is a collective investment scheme that invests in other companies and assets. This type of fund can issue an unlimited number of shares. Okay, it's time to get down to brass tacks now and test Simon's economy of language with our 60 second challenge. So Simon, your Director of Responsible Investment Portfolio Management, that doesn't actually describe what you do in the world of social impact investing, but that's about to change, hopefully, because you can enlighten us in 60 seconds uh, as to what you do and the asset class you invest in. So are you ready for this challenge? I think so. Good. Uh, your time starts now. So what I actually do in terms of um, investing is I'm actually targeting through conventional asset class, bonds, with my name. Of course, it had to be bonds. <laughs> um, things that are doing good for society. Um, and basically, there are two elements that I want to describe. One is bonds. They are in textbooks described as an IOU. They're not, they are just tradable loans. It's as simple as that. So through that conventional asset class, we're trying to target things that are doing good for society. Um, the spectrum of elements that we encompass in that go from really elements of excluding the bad to promoting the good. There are also a lot of acronyms. And the best thing I can describe in terms of the acronyms are the ESG and impact are differentiated by doing the right thing and doing the thing right. Doing the thing right is ESG, it's the internal behest of management, but doing the right thing is what we're targeting in terms of impact. And that's what I'm concentrating on. Wow, <laughs> you, you did that in about 58 seconds, I think. Now let's rewind to the financial past to see what was happening in August throughout history. On August 6, 2011, the credit agency Standard & Poor's downgraded the US Treasury debt from AAA to AA+, the first time the US's credit rating had been downgraded. Global stock markets crashed in the following days. On the 7th of August 1993, Buckingham Palace threw its doors open to tourists for the first time. It was a financial success, of course, and now over half a million people visit the palace each year. On August 15, 1992, the inaugural Premier League football matches were played. Manchester United won the league with Aston Villa and Norwich City in second and third respectively, while Nottingham Forest, Middlesbrough and Crystal Palace were relegated. Since 1992, the Premier League has generated £14.7 billion in domestic TV broadcasting rights revenue alone, according to Statista. Simon, we just heard about the downgrade of US Treasuries there. I suspect you remember that and the subsequent market chaos? I do indeed. And of course, that was a consequence of the global financial crisis that preceded it, that we are still um, having implications of today. Um, if you look at the markets as they exist at the moment, there are still those implications. Of course, the UK no longer is a AAA rated credit. And so that credit risk um, really stems from the global financial crisis and the excessive leverage, particularly, that we had at the time. 
Can you explain a little bit about credit ratings there? Because some of our listeners might understand what is a credit rating and how does it affect the, the, you know, the investment itself? Yes, in terms that you may have heard of, we have um, investment grade and high yield, so-called junk bonds. Those terms are defined by separate agencies, Standard & Poor's, Moody's, Fitch, mm -hmm. um, and they rate the credit worthiness of entities, governments, corporate bonds, etc., etc. Uh, and so when we refer to AAA, that's the best credit rating. Um, and when you lose the best credit rating, it has implications for your credit risk. And credit worthiness is the, the, the potential to repay the debt. Yes, yeah. at the end of the day, that's what a bond investment is all about. You are looking for the payment of coupons, of income, effectively, and you're also looking for your money back at the end of the day, <laughs> on time, um, when you should expect it. So a highly rated bond, you're more likely to get all of that. A lower rated bond, it's less Correct. likely. This business is very simple. It's all about risk and reward. So you're looking at the credit risk and you want a commensurate reward that pays you for the risk that you're taking. Okay, Anna, I think it's time to find out a little bit more about how Simon approaches the world of investing with our second round of questions. Simon, we've heard a bit now from you about how you look after strategies that invest for a social impact as well as a financial return. Um, you've referred to that as, as doing the right thing and doing the thing right. What's the difference? The difference is that doing the thing right is basically at the behest of management. It's managing your business in the best way that you can. However, the implications of your business on society, on local economies, etc., etc., may be a different thing. And so what we're looking at is actually taking it one stage further. So it's not just at the behest of management. We're actually talking about the wider implications on economies, local communities, etc. And going back to the, that economics A-level textbook, actually, it is in there. What we need to do is we need to encompass these social costs and social benefits in order that we allocate resources across an economy at the most efficient point. So actually it's basic good economics that I'm talking about. Yeah. You were the first investor in the UK social bond fund. What has changed since that day five years ago? Has the market evolved much? Yes, I was personally the first investor in the UK social bond fund. You're absolutely right. Um, yes, the market has changed. We have had, uh, at the time, we didn't have the green bond principles. We had the concept of green bonds, basically bonds that are just like any other corporate bond, but they are requiring management to spend the money that we give them on environmental projects, predetermined environmental projects. The markets develop that concept. We now have social bonds. We now have sustainability bonds that, again, require management to spend the money that we give them in certain predefined ways. That's been very helpful, the development of that technology, because I can use that new technology to the benefit of society and to the benefit of investors in the fund. Um, is infrastructure a large part of your universe? Yes, the bond market is really good at funding infrastructure. It's one of my passions, actually, mm. infrastructure. But if you think back to the railway bonds of the Victorian era, what that was doing was taking high capital outlay and a long payback period. And through funding via the bond market, that was the really appropriate and sustainable source of finance for those particular projects. Now we need infrastructure in this country in terms of the, the effect that it has not only on the economy, but also on society. And so actually using infrastructure to invest within the economy is a really good social benefit as well as financial benefit. Yeah, it's a huge area, isn't it? From roads, connecting communities, social yeah. mobility, through to, to university campuses. Well, if I look outside this building, ladies and gentlemen, we sit in the city of London overlooking the Thames and mm. we have a bond there that is named Basiljet. Basiljet was the original person that built the sewers in London. Mm. Um, the Thames Tideway Tunnel is being built at the moment and the bond is called Basiljet after the original designer of the sewers in London. Wow. That's a big capital project. I sit, I turn around behind me 180 degrees and we have Crossrail, another very large infrastructure project in a very highly populated, polluted capital city. Really important. These are things that we can invest through the bond market to bring to fruition. Yeah. How do you find opportunities in the investment universe that encapsulates what you're looking for? One of the things that I would define 
very clearly the way that we go about this is we don't have negative exclusion. We approach this through positive inclusion. We are actively looking for opportunities that are going to do good for society, but also give us the financial return that you should expect for the risk that we're taking. A lot of that comes through engagement. A lot of that comes through talking to companies, speaking to management. And in the bond market, where I operate, a lot of the opportunities come at the point where there is a new bond brought to the market. We have the opportunity to analyze that, the good that it's doing for society, the financial return that it can give, and also the opportunity to influence management through the questions that we ask and through the emphasis that we place on responsible investment. Um, I've got a kind of two-part question for you. How has investing in the ESG world evolved since you first took an interest in this, this area? And are there still misconceptions about either the broad ESG universal or social impact investing in particular? It has evolved. Um, and particularly, we are still dominated by negative exclusion policies. And there's absolutely nothing wrong in that, in excluding the bad. Mm elements there is nothing wrong in that but we have moved forward we've developed that into much more sustainable inclusive type policies um, and particularly the difficulty that we've had in terms of these acronyms that are used esg sri impact all these other elements they're very very difficult to get your your head round and as, as an investor i can quite understand they're difficult concepts which is why i go back to my assertion that you look at ESG and you look at impact as a, a furtherance of that. But the development of the market um, has occurred. I think we're swimming with the tide. I think this is something that is ongoing. I think it's something that's developing. If you look at the commitment of Columbia Threadneedle to this area, the number of people now in the responsible investment team, after five and a half years when we originally had four people in the team, we have developed in that commitment to the market. And also, if you look at some of the things out there in society, government, etc., we've declared a climate emergency um, through the UK Parliament. Um, I am calling upon the UK government to actually stop talking the talk and start walking the walk. I have launched a campaign uh, in order to get the UK government to launch green gilts, green government bonds, i.e. bonds that specifically target environmental projects raised by the UK government um, and I'm hoping that by these sorts of means etc we can promote that idea whereby we can do more as a financial industry we can do more as investors in voting with our coupons with our interest payments with our rental in actually putting that to work for the benefit of society the biggest problem that we have if we get it wrong the environment is going to cause a bigger problem for society generally than anything else I can think of. So that's where we start, but we don't stop there. We carry on. We talk about social housing, we talk about education, we talk about health, we talk about infrastructure, jobs, employment practices. These are all absolutely crucial elements to doing the right thing. And also, of course, doing the thing right. Yeah. You've alluded to previously, but do you think there'll be an ongoing increase in the demand for ESG going forward? I think we're seeing it already. One of the aspects that I have noticed this year has been a significant uptick in interest, in demand, in assets raised in this particular area, not just with the strategies that we're running here, but generally. And that goes alongside a significant uptick in issuance of the types of things that give you the opportunities to invest. If you look at the size of the growth of the green bond market, it's taken another leg up this year. We've now had the development of social bonds that are targeting social causes. I think I'm not just swimming with the tide, I'm swimming with a tidal wave. <laughs> um, and clearly we're not just talking about the UK here, are we? We're talking about, certainly in your universe, it's UK and Europe. Indeed, and in fact, um, I run a UK social bond fund, I run a European social bond fund, and now I run a global social bond fund. So it is around the world. There are opportunities and there are clearly uh, quite a lot of requirements in more deprived areas that we can target. And that's one of the things that we're looking to do. We're looking to define um, the social elements, particularly with these funds, in terms of trying to get the money to the areas that need it, trying to get the money to areas of more deprivation, constituents of society that need the money more, the old, the young, the disabled, areas of the country that are more deprived. And that is quite a, a challenge. 
Um, and I see that as a challenge every day, but I also am quite enthused by the fact that we are seeing opportunities to meet those challenges every day. Yeah. And how do you measure the, the, the impacts that your strategies or your funds are having? That is the key question when you move from environmental to social. It's difficult enough to measure the impact in environmental terms because of the consistency of the measures. Yeah. Um, but you can do it. You can look at carbon emissions, et cetera, et cetera. When you move to social, how do you capture the value of health to society mm. or education to society? And if you can, they'd be different measures, health and education. So what we do is we look for measures that provide evidence. So a measure to us is evidence, evidence of the good that the use of proceeds is doing in society. And so therefore we're looking for pretty much any measure we can find anywhere we can find it. And a lot of that comes from the companies, the issuing entities themselves. And so we ask the questions, we require them to provide the answers. And that's the way that we go about it. We synthesize all of that into what we call a social intensity score. And the social intensity score then becomes something that I can use to build a portfolio to enhance and optimize the social intensity of the portfolio. Can you remind us what the link is between the UN Sustainable Development Goals and the work that you do? Yes, the UN Sustainable Development Goals are really useful, really good, but there are 17 of them. They are fairly broad brush and they were originally set up not for this purpose. However, they are very, very good in terms of if you drill down within those UN Sustainable Development Goals to the actual requirements, the targets underlying them, you can actually see that it's both environmental and social that they're targeting. It's a really good way of communicating um, through um, the market, a common language, if you like, yeah. that you can use if you're running an equity portfolio, if you're running a fixed income portfolio or property portfolio, you can talk in a common language. Uh, about UN Sustainable Development Goals. And of course, if you do it properly and if you analyse it correctly, um, that tells you a great deal about what the sort of things that we're targeting are actually um, are actually about. Not everything we can cover in the bond market, not all 17, but there are other appropriate sustainable funding sources that can be used to target the things that we can't. So you put it all together across asset classes and it's a really good target to use and very of course, very high profile at the moment. You hear about UN SDGs, you see those little colored boxes everywhere you look, yeah. but actually underlying it, that's the important thing. What good is it doing for society? Mm. You've spoken about opportunities. Is there any risks that you're paying particular attention to on the horizon? There are always risks. Uh, and as a bond fund manager, unfortunately, our reputation is to focus on the risks. <laughs> yeah, you that's don't have the, a, p a positive reputation, no, do you? that's the nature of it. Um, that's very much my upbringing, really, in terms of protecting the downside. That's what a bond manager does. He's only going to get the coupons and the money paid back at the end of the day. The blue skies, that's for the equity guys. But of course, the risks are, I mean, I don't need to mention all the risks out there. And I'm certainly not going to mention the B word. Um, in our economy at the moment, which is again one of those risks. But actually, responsible investment involves encompassing all of the risks, whether they be environmental risks or social risks, etc., as the part of what we do. So when we're looking at the appropriate response to those risks in environmental or social terms, that could be seen as being an approach from a government to try and do the right thing as a government. Mm -hmm. And so what I'm looking at in terms of delivering um, the portfolio that does good for society is actually going to be ahead of the curve in terms of a regulatory response from governments. If governments catch up with what they should be doing, promoting the good, legislating against or taxing the bad, etc., we're going to be really well placed through these strategies to benefit from that financially. Finally, in this section, um, what would you consider your greatest success professionally? And the flip side of that, of course, is, is there anything you would do differently if you could go back in time? My greatest success um, that I will look back on when I uh, when I finish my days in investment is what I'm doing now. It's the launch of these kinds of strategies. This is not only my legacy, but my pride and joy. Um, and that's a very easy question to answer because mm -hmm. of that. Um, what would I do differently in terms of these strategies? Absolutely nothing. 
if I'd have had the idea and the opportunity earlier, I may have done it earlier, but actually now's the time, I think, when things are starting to move, it's absolutely the right time. Mm. So actually I wouldn't really change a lot. Maybe the world wasn't ready for Maybe the world wasn't ready for me. (laughs) (laughs) Thanks very much, Simon. That's a pleasure. Uh, Now, before we finish, we're going to quickly look at three things you can ask your independent financial advisor this month. We're still in the summer holidays, just about, so what better time to take stock of your investments? Checking how well the funds and other assets in your portfolio are performing is hugely important, and you should aim to double check if they're still on track to meet your goals at least once a year. Likewise, why not take time to read a book on the beach, but this time about money? There are several popular books in stores on how to keep your finances in check and how to save and invest. The content may just stick with you for longer than the latest airport thriller. And finally, if you haven't booked a holiday yet and you don't have a lot of spare cash lying around, and is it any wonder when the summer holidays cost parents up to £800 a month extra in childcare costs, according to Save the Children, you should research how to save money this summer. Of course, those who book late can usually save money, or of course you can stay at home and eat Marmite peanut butter that has no palm oil in, Simon. Yes, and being a parent myself, I'm very aware of these issues. It wasn't just that that my daughter challenged me with. Came home from work one night, She said, we've got so many hundred days to save the planet. What are you doing about it, Dad? And so we had to then Google Simon Bond, Green Gilts, and find out exactly what I'm doing about it. (laughs) More than most of us. Uh, Well, that's about it for this episode. All that's left is to thank our guest, Simon Bond. Uh, Simon, thank you. That's my pleasure. And thanks to my co-host for this episode, Anna Robinson. Thanks for having me, Mark. We'll be back next time when we'll have another fund manager to take on our 60 second challenge and talk us through their specialist field. If you have any questions or suggestions for the podcast, let us know at podcast at columbiathreadneedle.com. So until next time, thanks for listening and goodbye. Important information. Your capital is at risk. Past performance is not a guide to future performance. The analysis included in this podcast has been produced by Columbia Threadneedle Investments for its own investment management activities. Information obtained from external sources is believed to be reliable, but its accuracy or completeness cannot be guaranteed. None of Columbia Threadneedle Investments, its directors, officers or employees make any representation, warranty, guarantee or other assurance that any of these forward-looking statements will prove to be accurate. The mention of any specific shares or bonds should not be taken as a recommendation to deal. This podcast is not investment, legal, tax or accounting advice. Investors should consult with their own professional advisors for any advice. Issued by Threadneedle Asset Management Limited, registered in England and Wales, number 573204. Cannon Place, 78 Cannon Street, London, EC4N 6AG. Authorised and regulated in the UK by the Financial Conduct Authority. Columbia Threadneedle Investments is the global brand name of the Columbia and Threadneedle Group of Companies.